Today I'm going to show you what's inside of a Subaru Boxer engine and how it works. Now this is a 2 liter 4 cylinder engine but what makes it so unique is that the pistons are horizontally opposed to each other which is what makes this engine so wide yet sit very low for a nice low center of gravity in the car. Now this engine is also turbocharged being out of a WRX from the early 2000s and we're going to be tearing this thing apart so we can see just what causes these Subaru engines to fail so much. Now we're going to start here in the front of the engine where we have a timing belt that powers double overhead camshafts. We've got the crankshaft in the middle here with the two heads on either side. At the top here we have the intake and coming off the bottom of the head is the exhaust that runs over to the other side. Coming around the side here we've got your cold air intake which is going to bring cool air to the turbocharger. The turbocharger is going to use the exhaust gases to spool up and pressurize that air. It's then going to go to the intercooler which normally sits on top here and then feed it down into the throttle body which will feed forcefully air down into the cylinder head. Now coming around the back here this engine does sit longitudinally. The transmission bolts up to here and the front axles come out this way which means that most of the engine's weight is actually in front of the front axles for a nose heavy car. Whoa! Oh, we got the milkshake. I found coolant and oil mixed inside of here. They told me this engine had rod knock. Let's see if it turns over. It's a bit of a stiff spot and it completely stops. Then I can knock the crank bolt loose, so it's pretty stiff. In order to access some bolts for this intake, I'm going to start by removing the turbocharger. I'm going to remove the oil feed line here. All right, with some of the bolts loose there, I can remove the up pipe. I'm going to remove this turbocharger. And there's one more line for it here. And here's a look at the turbocharger. Comment down below if you want a separate video on how a turbocharger works. So with that turbocharger out of the way, I can access all the bolts for the intake. And over on the driver's side head, same thing. I remove all the intake bolts. Hopefully I got all the wires and hoses free and I can lift off this intake in piece. Might have forgotten something down here. Now I should be able to remove the intake. And now with the intake out of the way, I can get to the last bolt holding this AC compressor on. And then remove this AC compressor. And with the intake out of the way, we can take a look at the top of the engine. You can see you've got a couple of coolant lines over here that go to the heater core as well as the throttle body. You have a coolant passover over here. Back here we have a PCV valve as well as ventilation on both valve covers. Now I did find a lot of coolant in the oil pan, but boy, there's a lot of coolant residue and water evidence back into these intake ports. So this is going to be a really messy teardown inside. Just going to remove all the tens that hold this coolant jacket on. All right, now I can remove this coolant jacket crossover pipe. Next let's remove these timing covers in the front of the engine here. Whoa blue timing belt. All right since these bolts don't want to come out I'm gonna to have to encourage them to come out. We'll zip off the crank. Remove some more timing belt cover bolts. Take off that cover. Now taking a look at this unique timing belt setup, you've got a crankshaft in the middle here which is going to drive your dual overhead cams on both sides. This engine does not have variable valve timing. You have a total of five pulleys here that are just idlers and then your water pump pulley. Now just next to the water pump is your thermostat housing and just behind this crank pulley is the oil pump integrated into the casing here. Now the cam bolts are 10 millimeter hex so let's see if we can use the engine's weight to break them free. <sighs> I'm going to start here by removing the tensioner and the tensioner here you can see it's just a spring-loaded hydraulic tensioner that pushes up against the casing and pivots like this you just peel off that belt let's get the rest of these pulleys off here the crank bolt off I'm wondering why these feel so loose you can just move them so freely by hand all right let's pull these gears off here they actually feel like plastic they don't feel like metal this one looks like it's metal one thing about Subaru, they've got Japan stamped everywhere. So for those of you who like to only source things from the good countries, I'm going to remove the inner timing cover off. Let's pull that one off. Ever use an impact to take off a hose clamp? This thing is so brittle and been sitting for so long, you don't even need to use a hose clamp. It just tears right off. All right, I'm going to remove these 12s from the top here. I'm going to remove this idler. A weird little small idler, right? Eh? And then this bracket pops off. All right, now we can remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold this water pump and thermostat housing assembly to the block. And I can just pull that off. Let's remove this. Next up, I'm going to remove all the tens that hold the valve cover on the driver's side here. Coils out of here. Really rusty around the top. This one looks good too. All right, now I should be able to pry off this valve cover. 
take a look at that the coolant in the engine actually made it all the way to the valve cover and you can see some of that milky residue now the ej series of subaru engines came in both single overhead camshaft and dual overhead camshafts like this one in the dual overhead camshaft configuration each camshaft directly acts upon a valve bucket and in a single overhead cam you have one camshaft in the middle with rocker arms that go over to each valve the advantage of course is if you have variable valve timing you can vary the timing on each side as opposed to having one fixed timing oh yeah and this is a lot simpler because you don't have extra parts with roller rocker arms now, i've taken apart a lot of engines and never been able to rotate the camshafts this easily this thing probably needs a valve adjustment to bring the valves up to contact the camshaft so it's not that easy to rotate the other thing is this only has two cylinders on this side so instead of having four lobes with one of them almost always touching valves giving you that resistance this has only two that are 90 degrees apart this thing's also been sitting a while so you can see the rust build up here on the cam lobes all right let's get these camshaft caps out of here okay it's not super worn out let's pull this camshaft out camshaft itself doesn't really look worn here we have the camshaft seal get the exhaust off again this one looks pretty good doesn't look overly worn also have these knockouts here that allow the camshaft to poke through and power accessories and other models I'm just going to crack these head bolts loose. Now this is also one of the weak points on these Subaru engines is that these bolts could actually come loose causing the same issues as a blown head gasket. This is a 14 millimeter 12 point socket. Okay, this one's actually tight. Now before I get this head off, I gotta turn it over and get the exhaust side. But before we do that, let's get the other side head bolts loose. All right, here we are on the passenger side. I can first pull off these coils here. Throw those in the garbage. I'm gonna pull all the 10 millimeter bolts for the valve cover. This one looks a lot darker than the other side. The so same thing on this side, I can rotate the cam very loose. This one here is actually stuck on the tip of its cam lobe. Wow, look at the overheating on here. You can see how this area has been warmed up due to lack of friction. A little bit of scoring. That one's okay as well. There we are. Camshaft actually looks pretty good. Just a slight discoloration, probably from some overheating. Get the intake side off. Camshaft looks good too. Alright, we're gonna knock off the head bolts over on this side. Okay, I'm gonna zip these bolts loose. Just leave one in there so that when I turn it over, it doesn't fall on me. Yeah, if you're gonna be rebuilding your Subaru, definitely get new head studs. These were not the best from the factory. Alright, now I need to flip this over so I can get to the exhaust. Oh, this crap on the floor. Okay, I got my wife's old dress here. I'll just put that down. I even stole the kitchen towels. This should work really good. Now, the engine inside here, you have a good look at the unequal length exhaust header. You got the exhaust on the passenger side here that has to come around over to the driver's side here and join up with the one on the passenger side before going to the turbocharger. This is called unequal length headers, and that creates a very unique exhaust note for this engine. Of course, the disadvantage is going to be the loss of power because you got to bring air all the way over from the other side, and it's not a very smooth and even flow looking over here on the passenger side this is where the oil filter resides and we've got the passenger side engine mount and go ahead and remove all these 14 millimeter nuts that hold the header now over on the driver's side i'm just going to peel back this heat shield here oh my god look at all the rust all right now with that heat shield out of the way i can remove the exhaust bolts on the driver's side now i should be able to remove the whole exhaust well while i'm down here i'm also going to remove the engine mount that's all that holds the engine in it. With the passenger side engine mount. Lucky thing, I kept that extra bolt in the head. Now I can remove it and remove the head from the block. Okay, things are not looking good. More on that later. Yeah, underneath that head doesn't look any better. You can see these valves here are probably bent. All right, and I flipped it back over. I'm gonna remove the last bolt over on the driver's side and then remove the head. Oh boy, there's more valves here that don't look like they're in the right spot. All right, now I'm gonna flip the engine over. All right, with the engine now flipped upside down, I'm gonna go ahead and remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold this oil pan on. I find it interesting that Subaru is still using these lock nuts on these oil pan bolts, unless if someone's been here before. All right, it's hammer time. Oh boy, it's messy. Yep, definitely a milkshake in there. All right, let's get the uh, windage tray and this pickup tube here off. Look at that pickup tube. It's clogged with debris. Probably starve the engine of oil. Pop off this tray. It turns out I can actually use the impact to break the engine free when it was seized. So the rotating assembly seems to free itself up now. Get this filter off here. And I'm glad to see that they do have an oil cooler, this being a turbocharged model. 
I'll go ahead and remove this oil cooler from the block. The last piece is the oil pump, which is in front of the crankshaft. Now in order to tear this thing down further, we need to get it off the stand to split the block. Now taking a look at how the block of this boxer engine is constructed, you've got two halves here that split down the middle that revolves around the crankshaft. And you can see that it's not exactly easy to get to the connecting rod caps you would in a normal four-cylinder engine. And that's because you're actually supposed to take out the piston heads itself from the connecting rod out from this side and then split the block in half in order to access the connecting rods themselves. In order to do that there's these access holes on either side of the engine that allow you to knock the wrist pins out from those pistons so that you can release the piston from the connecting rod. Now this is actually a 14 millimeter hex and I don't have a 14 millimeter hex and just use a hammer and a punch and then once that's been knocked free I can just use my favorite 14 millimeter bolt and nut to wind that off and now I can turn the crankshaft over to line up the circlip and now I've got access to remove that circlip inside of there and come in with these pliers here and remove that circlip now on the back side of the block there's these two access ports for the same wrist pins on the back cylinders and you really should be using an impact driver for this and I don't really have the right tools so I'm just going to use my hammer and punch all right, now we got that access hole. All right, now I'm going to pry off this side of the cover here. There we go. Now we've got access to another hex bolt. You can just spin that hex bolt out of there. There's one circlip. Here's the other circlip. In order to free that wrist pin so I can get the piston head off, I'm going to use a long screwdriver and hammer that all the way through so I can get the wrist pin out the other access hole. Taking this engine apart is a lot more complicated than a regular four banger. In order to split this block, there's a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts that go around the circumference. Now holding this block together, there's a bunch of 12.12 millimeter bolts located inside of the water jacket. There's some bolts on the inside here. Just zip these off. And of course they put a bolt here where you can only access it with a wrench. You also hit this. 10 millimeter inside of the winded tray. And with all the bolts released, it's time to split the block. And you can remove the crankshaft. You see the crankshaft comes out with the connecting rods without the wrist pin or the piston heads. And here we're left with the two half blocks. And here we've got the connecting rods attached to the crankshaft. Right, let's have a look at these connecting rod bearings. So here's connecting rod number two. I was told that this engine was knocking when I bought it and I can see that there is visible connecting rod damage to the bearings here. So this engine was definitely starved of oil but it didn't spin any bearing. Connecting rod number three didn't fare any better. You can see there is visible wear on those bearings. Same thing over at number four, visible wear on the bearings but nothing too major. And connecting rod number one is just worn. Again, it did not overheat or spin any bearings so I'm actually surprised this engine might have been salvageable. All we're left here is the two halves of the block and the crankshaft. So we'll start with the crankshaft itself. It's actually a very light unit. It doesn't have to be as heavy via the counterweight on either side and that's because with a boxer four-cylinder engine the pistons are opposing each other which means that the forces cancel each other out and you don't have that much shaking forces as you would in an upright engine. And in the case of this particular engine there's not too much wear on this crankshaft. Nothing failed catastrophically at the bottom end here and it probably could have been salvaged. Taking a look at the bottom end here one of the disadvantages to having the pistons horizontally opposed to each other is that it takes a little while for that oil to drain back from your sideways block here down into your oil sump and that's why Subaru is trying to make an attempt here to make a really deep oil pan and to put this oil pickup tube really far down inside of there and bury it in two separate layers of oil baffles just as an attempt to try to keep the oil down covering the oil baffle so it doesn't suck up air by any accident especially when you're sloshing around corners. Now of course there's still going to be some people who are going to neglect these engines and run them low on oil and that's going to cause rod knock because you starve these engines of oil. Very common problem on these Subaru EJ engines so if you've got one make sure you top up the oil very frequently. Now oil is going to begin its journey from that oil pan through this oil pickup tube here. I don't see any shards inside of this engine here. I think it was just the milkshake that was inside that kind of totaled it out. Now oil is going to travel up through this part of the block here and then to this face over here which is where the oil pump mounts to. Now the oil pump is driven off of the crankshaft directly and it's going to provide oil fluid flow and then send it over to this half of the block through this port over here. Now oil from the oil pump is going to be sent down through this hole over here down to the oil filter and cooler. The cooler sits at the bottom here. This is just a heat exchanger that exchanges it with the coolant. 
Now the filtered oil is then going to travel back up through here and then across this way and then over to this port where it's going to flow over to the other side of the block. Now another disadvantage to having a split block is that you have these interfaces where oil has to flow through and it's a potential for oil leak. That's why you have these o-rings here and you could lose oil pressure. Now there's an oil galley for each half of the block. You can see there's an oil galley that runs along this way and these bearings are going to be feeding off of that. And then on this half of the block we've got another oil galley that runs along the length this way and these bearings feed off this way. Now tapping off of the main oil galley we've got our oil feed ports that are going to go to each head respectively to lubricate the camshaft. Now typically you'd see oil sprayers that will feed off the main oil galley to lubricate the walls of the cylinder so the piston can move up and down. In Subaru's case they've actually notched this part out here so that when this is installed on the connecting rod it will spray oil out through this connecting rod bearing and that's going to lubricate the outside here for this piston to move up and down. Sometimes when you push these engines a little too hard the notches that hold these rings inside will actually blow out a hole and then you're going to lose compression and that's called ringland failure. Now Subaru is not immune to typical oil burning problems. You can see that the oil control ring inside of here is actually pretty gummed up and that's going to prevent a lot of oil that's inside of this cylinder wall here from escaping back through that oil control ring and down to the piston over to stay on the cylinder wall side as opposed to being in the combustion side of the piston. As a result when this clogs up you end up burning oil because the oil can't get back down here and drain into the sump. So here's the piston that was full of that oil coolant mix and you can see that the oil and coolants made this muck inside of here and that tends to clog up control rings because oil and coolant don't necessarily do each other's job properly you got coolant which is not really good at lubricating things and then you got oil which is not really good at cooling things off therefore you get engine failure if you ran it too long now oil and coolant mixing together is likely due to a failure in the head gasket the radiator or the oil cooler itself which has an internal leak causing them to mix together the head gasket is the most common failure on Subarus let's talk about the elephant in the house and that's Subaru's head gasket failure you can see here this is a multi-layer steel head gasket which is actually the upgraded version older versions use a composite material sometimes they'd come under torque from the factory sometimes they would just warp the head sometimes it would leak externally from this coolant jacket which sits around the combustion chamber and then you'd get a coolant leak on the outside of the vehicle underneath the engine and Subaru has struggled a lot with this head gasket issue. Now more so the fact that the engine is situated horizontally makes it very difficult to access the heads on this engine much less even spark plugs or valve covers and that means that you pretty much have to remove the engine from the vehicle in order to do a proper job. Now if the head gasket fails such as between the combustion chamber and the coolant jacket or the return jacket then the oil and coolant are going to mix together and then you have that wonderful milkshake that we see in the oil pan. Now moreover once the combustion chamber is filled with water as you can see this one's super rusty so you can tell it's been sitting for a long time with water inside of it. Water is not compressible and while this might not be an interference engine the piston is going to come down and try to compress that water and it's going to bend the valves and as you can see in this case the valves are bent open and you can no longer hold compression. Let me see if I can pop that back in. That valve's bent. You can see it's not seated properly at the bottom and it's trying to close at the top. Now flipping the head back over, this being the turbocharged model, a little bit more upgraded. We've got individual coils for each spark plug and we've got dual overhead camshafts. This was a little bit before variable valve timing. Now, taking a look at the intake system, this engine being turbocharged means that you've got a lot more complexity in terms of plumbing and electronics in order to control the turbocharged system. Now here you can see the throttle body would mount up to and that is going to control the amount of air going individually into the four cylinder. Here you can see we've got the fuel injectors that will be injected right into that stream that goes into the engine. So you don't have to deal with carbon buildup because this one's not direct injected. Now taking a look at the turbocharger, you've got the exhaust gases that are going to come in through here and the turbocharger is going to use the flow of that gas to spin up this little turbine over here. Now this turbine is then going to pressurize the air that's coming in through here into this side of the turbine wheel which is called the compressor side and that's going to push pressurized air down in through the intake system so you can get more air which means more combustion and thus more power. Now of course with the turbocharge you've got added complexity. We do have extra oil lines running here to lubricate it. We've got an extra set of coolant lines over here to keep things cool in the airstream. And then of course we've got a boost controller which is vacuum actuated and that's just going to control this valve over here if there's too much pressure built up in the exhaust to vent it back out through the exhaust and bypass the turbocharger. And that's pretty much what's inside of a turbocharged Subaru four-cylinder boxer engine and how it works. Now if you are thinking of buying one of these make sure you check out all the telltale signs of engine failure especially keep an eye on your oil and coolant levels and subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.